Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mauricio Rodriguez. I'm a professor and district-wide coordinator of Chicanic Studies at El Paso Community College. And I am here today with Francisco Delgado. This interview is part of the Humanities Collaborative at El Paso Community College and UTEP. Uh, this particular interview is focusing on a project that I am working with or working on uh, with my research assistant, um, Vanessa Zamora. Um, and so we're going to begin our talk here with Mr. Delgado. Uh, so we have some pre-written questions that you, you know, had access to before our discussion today. We're going to jump around here, but, you know, to give everyone an idea as to you know what it is that we're talking about, who it is we're, or we're speaking with. Can you please tell us about yourself, your upbringing, uh, and your profession, uh, either directly or indirectly as an artist? So, so as, you, as you mentioned, Mauricio, uh, my name is Francisco Delgado. I am originally from Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. Um, I came to the U.S. as you know, a very young, um, going back and forth. Uh, to, well, came to the uh, Paso, uh, very young, going back and forth uh, to Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, um, as many fronterizos have, have done over, over many, many years. Um, I studied here in the U.S., um, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, at Bowie High School, uh, and then I continued at El Paso mm -hmm. Community College, the, where, you know, I, I uh, I studied most of my basics and then transferred to UTEP where I studied my bachelor's degree in fine arts. Um, and uh, after that, I went on to the Yale School of Art to get my master's in uh, or my MFA in uh, printmaking, uh, painting and drawing. Uh, I am a, a Visual artist, uh, which entails, uh, you know, painting, drawing, printmaking. I am also an illustrator, um, and I am, uh, you know, full-time educator, uh, you know, for the high schools and and, uh, and college community as well. Um, I remember when you and I first met, and this is tied into who Francisco Delgado is and who he just um, identified as um, and shared with us at the opening of this video. But uh, I just want to share that story because I think it's really interesting and it speaks to, to who you are and the work that you do. Um, when I first made contact with you, it was a cold call. Uh, Marco Sanchez and I had talked about this the way he and I met and it was the same thing. Um, I went through essentially images that I had either saved on my computer or I had in one way some sort of graphic, maybe it was a postcard, maybe it was a flyer, uh, maybe it was an article in a paper. And I looked your name up, uh, you know, I looked you up on the uh, interwebs and I reached out to you, I think through your official website, and it was just basically a, a shot in the dark, it was an email, right, I sent you and identified, you know, who I was kind of briefly, said I was really interested in your work. Uh, I mentioned that I'd first seen your work at the Bridge Center for Contemporary Arts back in, I think that was 1998, um, when I first saw your work. And back then I was in grad school, and I think that equates to everyone's understanding, I was very poor. And so looking at art in uh, a small independent gallery in downtown El Paso. This was not, you know, like a government funded or a municipal museum. I'd never really been to a private art gallery, but then seeing the imagery in front of me, I was I was blown away and I was extremely moved. And they those images stuck with me uh, for years and years. And I don't know how this came about, but when I was going through some of my, my images, I found these large, uh, I guess they're kind of like, like postcards, I don't know if you have a specific name for them or not, like a standard size, they're much larger. And it was of a painting that was owned by Juan Sandoval, uh, was on display at Cinco Puntos Presses, the, the local publisher's uh, um, headquarters or main building in downtown El Paso. And now it resides in Austin, Texas with the Mexi Arte Museum. And I remember seeing that image. Um, 
and it just resonated with me. And that's the postcard that I found. Well, actually, when I met this uh, on video, maybe I shouldn't. I had a stack of them. Uh, I guess I I taken them from that gallery because I just loved it so much. I was like, these are just super cool. And I want to send these to people and and show them, you know, uh, what talents we have in our community. Um, and I never did send those to, to anyone. I I kept most of them. I have given a, some away to students. Uh, there's one on my on my office door, and I remember I would just look at it every time I opened the door. And I thought, you know, I want to try to contact this artist. And lo and behold, you responded, and I was like, wow, super excited. And you and I started talking, and the connections that we had, uh, the the shared relationships with people that we knew mutually. Uh, and the fact that, you know, your path was just so, so moving to me. And um, well, we'll probably be talking a little bit more about that. But uh, I remember uh, mentioning some people to you and, and you would, you know, very, you know, kind of matter of factly and very casually say, yeah, you know, I know some person or you know, I, I saw this work in, in a book. And it's like, you're familiar with this, uh, this art historian out of Arizona State. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking about uh, Gary Keller. And I was like, yeah, you know, his books are beautiful. And I was in Chicago when I met, you know, Professor Keller, Dr. Keller, back in 2012. Uh, and I was there with Juan Sandoval. And, uh, you know, we were talking about some of the local artists. And, of course, at that point, I didn't know anybody. Uh, but I mentioned that book to you. Uh, I think it's called uh, Contemporary Mexican Art. And it's in two volumes. And uh, you didn't say anything. You, know, you, you didn't mention anything about, you know, the work contained in that book. And... And then one day I was speaking to Margie, my wife, about you, and se me prendió el foco, and I was like, "Wait one second. And I ran to my to my desk and I pulled out the I think it was volume one, and I just flipped through it, and lo and behold, there you were, in uh, Dr. Keller's book. <laughs> and I was thinking, being cheap, I'm sure it's like, <laughs> and I say that you know with. With the utmost respect and just you know adoration for for you as a person and the work that you do uh you're so humble and you shouldn't be um the work that you do is monumental it's inspirational it's very important and uh that was when i then realized like women i've seen his work in other publications and i started pouring through just the stuff that we have in our in in our library at home and just kept popping up you know you just kept popping up in so many different books and I could think he's like, wow, I know we have this tremendous talent here and he is so humble. And um, now that I've known you for you know a few years, you know, I still wonder, it's like, gosh, you know, um, it'd be awesome if you had like, I guess that, that kind of inkling to self promote a little bit more. And it's not a criticism. It's just like uh, the importance and the value of what you do and who you are really needs to be on everyone's radar. Everyone needs to understand who you are. Uh, what you do, uh, but anyhow, um, you know what? Everything has has come so naturally in a way that I feel like I I don't have to be anybody else. Like uh, I, you know, I'm being myself. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Segundo Barrio with some people would say would be disadvantaged, but I had the most important, you know, teachers. You know, Rosa Guerrero was my dance instructor when I was little. Gaspar Enriquez was my high school art teacher while well, the time that I was there. Um, Felipe Alame, you know, also mentored me. So these are these are people that um, that are really, really important people with, you know, within our, our culture. And, you know, just like that, you know, the, I think that that my my work has opened up a lot of, uh, you know, doors, a lot of relationships because people identify you know, with the work. Um, and I think it's just because I'm naturally talking about my experience. I'm not, you know, talking about something that I read in a book. It's like it's stuff that I've, you know, that I've lived through. Um, and I think those those connections had have really, um, you know, resonated with people. And, 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 you know, like I said, I feel very fortunate to to have that, you know, in my in my life. And so you're mentioning a, a lot of very important names here, um, and I want to go through you know some of these some of these places and people that we, we keep bringing up because um, hopefully well the people in our community will will understand and recognize who we're talking about. But for those who may view viewing this video elsewhere at some other 
point in time in history, or in the future, I should say. Um, the community from which you work, and this is part of the project and one of the overall goals uh, that I want others to understand and appreciate is the work that is produced by you uh, in this space, from this space, and then directing it outward. But then also, of course, you know, embracing it here within the community is extremely unique. It's not like other murals. It's not like other paintings. It's not like other prints. And one of the questions that we had here on the list um, asked that you talk about one of these specific mediums. And we can talk about the one, uh, the one medium that's on the list. We can branch off and talk about something else. But I do want to, you know, come back to the focus of this project, and that is to talk about how being uh, a person from El Paso Juarez, Las Cruces, and this is kind of the area, the region that I was focusing on, and working from here, um, the, the sensibility, the aesthetic that you present, okay, it's not just a product of the environment. Obviously, the environment's changing as you represent it, as you obviously discuss other larger or even more detailed ideas in your work as well. But that sensibility, uh, that work from the frontera, the borderlands, where we reside, because of where we are, again, a binational, bicultural, bilingual area of the world that is unmatched. There's no other place on the planet like El Paso Juarez. Geographically, we're isolated for hours, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any other major metroplex. So we have what I would describe as kind of this little microcosm, this little uh, isolated biosphere where an identity, where a language, where an aesthetic erupts, it blossoms, and then it branches out. Uh, and you're not going to see this in other border regions. I'm talking about the U.S., Mexico, southern U.S. border region. You're not going to find this in El Paso. I'm sorry, in San Diego, Tijuana. You're not going to find it in Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, Brownsville, McAllen. Uh, you're not going to find it in those areas because, well, they don't have the scale. They don't, they don't have essentially our history, the importance, and they don't have that same isolation. So they're actually a little bit opened up. Uh, in South Texas, maybe, you know, they're a little bit more rural, but again, we got to go, what, four hours to the north to hit the next major city. We got to go another three and a half south to hit Chihuahua. We got to go west six hours, Tucson, San Antonio to the east. That's eight hours. So yeah, we're we're this massive, massive community. The official numbers are what around three million, but we know unofficially because of the problems with, with data collection, especially counting people. I always assume that we were well well above three million over a decade ago, unofficially. And I'm thinking now because of the expansion, the growth in our region, especially in Juarez, uh, it's upwards of, you know, four plus million. So this is not a small town. And the ideas and the people that, that well, exist in this space are very different from the rest of the country, U.S. and Mexico, right? Because we have, we have this phenomenon, right? We're so I, far west Texas, we're not in Texas anymore. I think definitely it, it goes both ways as far as as, uh, as being unique. Uh, we know that you know when we travel to you know cities like San Antonio or, or Chicago is like they they see you know the front as like well, at least you know Pasuans or or, or Paso Juarez people as something that is is very kind of like they they can't they can't read us very well because we're both you know we're definitely like you know Mexicanos we're. Um, Chicanos, we're you know, fronterizos, we're bordeños, um, and we get kind of like that same that same reading or that same uh, sort of feeling when when we travel to like Oaxaca or Mexico City. There's like you're Mexicano, but you're like you're not like fully Chicano because you like you know you you know how to speak the language. You kind of know some of our you know some of our culture and and and. Uh, so you, we always get that, you know, being very unique, uh, you know, in both uh, the U.S. and Mexico. So it's definitely, you know, the, the frontera here is is, uh, is definitely a very unique place. And yeah, and the identities, we it's it's, it's a very interesting kind of experience. Uh, we are a waypoint. You know this, right? Uh, I think it was, uh, and I hope not misidentifying the author, but I think it was Gloria Anzalo who says that we suffer from a kind of cultural schizophrenia. It may have also been another Chukenya, another El Paso in uh, Alicia Gaspar de Alba, who may have said that. And so it's either Anzalua or Gaspar de Alba, but they said we suffer from a cultural schizophrenia. 
In other words, it's kind of a crisis of identity. Uh, in, um, but we also have the ability to move fluidly, right? And that is something that's very unique to us and a part of your work and uh, part of the, the work of the artists that, you know, that we're lucky to, to surround ourselves with. Um, and of course, the, the medium that you work in is not just a personal choice, but you know, it's also affected by, well, the environment, the area that you're in as well, how work is perceived, how your work is also consumed. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because uh, this is one of the, the delicate areas that I always feel very, very you know, unversed in, in, in talking about is how, how we view art, who has the art, how is art shared and produced, and how is it made much more accessible. But um, I don't even know which piece we should focus on or medium. Uh, I want the question on the list I sent you was about printmaking and kind of these assumptions of, well, of the non-art collecting world that a print is something that comes out of a machine on your desk. You know, a brother printer puts out a, a print, right? But uh, what you do is nowhere near what that machine does. Printmaking is varied, it's complex. Um, your technique is one of the ones that we fully appreciate and we fully love. And I live and work with your pieces every single day. There's not a single day that it goes by that I don't look at your work. Um, so we can talk a little bit about printmaking and kind of dispel that that misunderstanding or any other medium. No, no, that's fine. Uh, so, so definitely printmaking comes from like a like a commercial um, type of uh, of industry, you know, uh, silk screening T-shirts or or even lithography at at one point was uh, was used to you know to sort of print books or or pamphlets and all that stuff. Uh, but I think over the years, uh, it sort of uh, switch from just you know being a, a something that uh, you know that is commercial to something that people would voice their you know their opinions. We have the um, the taller de, de arte gráfico in, in Mexico City, where you know you have all these protest uh, posters being made, being produced you know through the through the medium of, of printmaking. Uh, you know the Chicano uh, civil rights movement was also part of it. You know you have uh, uh, you know the the, um, uh, the farm workers, you know, producing uh, posters so they could, you know, tell the community what was happening. They would, you know, uh, have their voices printed on there. So definitely, like, we have a history, and I've adopted, you know, that that kind of lineage um, where I can, you know, I can produce work or, you know, fine arts work with, you know, with a social background, social content, um, um, distributed to you know, to somebody that, you know, that, that could, you know, could pay, uh, you know, for 10, you know, $10, $15, um, or even, you know, just pass them out. Um, so it's something that, you know, that again, that's accessible to people. Uh, it's not, you know, a painting where sometimes, you know, it's worth, you know, a lot more, um, more than, than, you know, than what some people can pay. Um, so I think that's what attracts me to, to that medium, you know, to printmaking. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely fine arts, but at the same time, it, it has that social background, you know, that you can educate people through, you know, through your imagery. And um, so let's run down the list of the kind of prints that you work with. So you mentioned lithography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, um, I do silk screen. You know, I have my own, you know, my own studio where I produce uh, screens, even on T-shirts. Uh, you know, my t-shirts also have, you know, some sort of social message uh, behind them. Uh, we do, uh, or I do linoleum, uh, relief printing, uh, where you carve on, on a piece of linoleum or even a piece of, uh, of wood. Uh, you roll it up, put paper on it, pass it through the press, and then you have an impression. Um, lithography is, is one of the most complex processes. You know, uh, you have to know your your form formulas, you have to know your your uh, um, your chemistry a little bit uh, in order for for the image to you know to come out. Um, so those are those are the printmaking media's that I that I uh, I guess focus on or that I uh, that I work in. So we have uh, we have a few of your pieces uh, at our home. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite ones is uh, American Graffiti 2, I believe. Um, 
And what's interesting, I don't know if I shared this with you, and I can't, I can't, I want to sh swing the camera around to show you, but the truck in that print mm -hmm. is actually parked in front of my house. Um, it's not mine, it's my neighbor's truck, but that exact model and year of, of Ford F-150, uh, I believe is a 73, correct? It's in the 70s, yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> it's in the, yeah, the, but uh, yeah, that, and it's, it's a trip to me because um, I see it in in our in our back room, and then when I walk out to throw out the trash, go in the front yard. There's that troquita there, and I think about it, it's like okay, so inside I have this representation, and outside, you know, on my street, you know, is this truck, and it's missing the the bed of the truck. So, and and this is I don't know, I think something unique to a lot of El Paso neighborhoods is it's not unusual to see you know a vehicle parked either on the street or maybe in the front yard that's in a various stage of of reconstruction because uh, you know we're always taking our time to to work on our vehicles um but it's it's interesting that i'm able to actually make that connection both outside physically in the real world and in here um obviously we have your work that we're talking about that exists but then looking at that image and that's one of the my favorite images because it also uh, reminds me of my father um the man walking down the street you know with his legs melting into the sidewalk uh, I, hopefully part of this uh this uh, project will allow me to incorporate kind of a gallery of some of these these images that we talk about but uh, that image and this kind of ties into the the next question uh, i sent you is uh the scenery of where we are the frontera the borderlands is something that of course you and i understand and we appreciate uh most people think of el paso juarez as well there are a lot of stereotypes associated with us most of them are you know, offensive. Uh, all of them are incorrect, uh, but we understand how we how we move between you know these areas and what you choose to actually portray in your work is one of the reasons why you know I was just so enamored and so drawn uh, to well your your hand and the th the things that you can do with that, but the symbolism, the imagery, uh, the context that you present, all of that was like. Uh, extremely powerful to me, and uh, I wanted you to tell me, maybe talk a little bit about um, the vibrancy, the the essence, the life, uh, what makes El Paso Juarez so beautiful for millions of people to want to live, to stay here. Well, definitely, like part of you know, part of the work and part of of who we are as 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 a city is is uh, you know, it's, it's the workforce. You know, we are it's the you know, in a way, blue collar workers, it's, it, everything's founded, you know, on that. Um, I know my family comes from, you know, people that that have worked in roofing for, you know, myself, I was a roofer when I was young, um, you know, uh, our ideas and, and my mom, you know, cleaning houses and stuff like that. So, like, it comes from, you know, from the working man, um, you know, the truck that was de that's depicted in, in that image is, it's actually a cartonero truck where they have, you know, kind of like the rails on the side because they stack cardboard, you know, really as high as they can uh, or pallets, you know, to sell them. So I think definitely that's that's one of the things that, you know, that El Paso is kind of founded on, you know, the, the worker, you know, the, the immigrant. Um, so I try to depict, you know, depict that in, in the work, uh, whether it be, you know, through textures, whether it be through, uh, through iconic images, um, you know, things that are, that we see around, you know, the star, the, the, the star in, a, in El Paso, the Cerro, you know, Lea La Biblia, um, all that uh, I try to put in, into the work so that, you know, the working class or anybody that's around can identify with, uh, with the imagery and symbols as well. And your work is, uh... Is I would say it is uh, overt in its in its uh, social criticism, in its political criticism, um, and some people, you know, they may not understand that. Especially again, people who are not familiar with El Paso Juarez, again, they may have heard of us and they may assume that we still ride horses out here and we all wear cowboy boots and sombreros or um, those those kind of you know misunderstandings are pervasive outside of the region. But some of the stark realities that we deal with that I would say are the opposite of uh, a beautiful aesthetic is the, the militarization of our communities. 
Uh, and that's something that's very, very strong in a lot of your recent work that we have. Um, the border wall, which we all know about, but if you not if you're not from this area it, and looking at pictures or video of the border wall still does not do it justice because to stand at any vantage point where you can see the horizon and the wall and to then realize and understand what you're looking at as being a man-made product that is essentially just a, a, a line, a drawing, almost like you would see this bold Sharpie marker line down a, you know, a blank page of paper. And this is what we look at and, and have to deal with. Uh, you depict the border wall, you depict um, the militancy of that wall and its surveyors, the, you know, the eyes, the, the boots on the ground, talking about um, all the different groups under the Department of Homeland Security, right? Of course, Border Patrol, everybody's familiar with, uh, but we have customs and then we have all these joint projects with just about every single uh, law enforcement entity known in this country and unknown. A lot of people don't know this, but we we have the densest law enforcement uh, population per capita in the country. Uh, and it, part of it has to do with the military bases that we're surrounded by. We've got Fort Bliss. We have uh, Holloman Air Force Base. we got White Sands Missile Range. Uh, we have, you know, just this entire presence of, well, uh, a reminder of <laughs> not beauty. Um, and, and I think that's what, one of the reasons or, or part of the reason why I depicted because like I, I wanted to, I want to document also what's happening and what has happened to us fronterizos, you know, over the past, you know, couple of decades where the dynamics of, you know, of families, the dynamics of the cities have changed because of the militarization of, of our border, uh, you know, of the wall and stuff. I think, um, you know, it, it sort of uh, puts, like you said, a sharpie, you know, line, uh, you know, through our, you know, through our uh, uh, geographical um, landscape and stuff. And and that is, uh, you know, again, like I said, one that's one of the reasons why I want to depict it because it has affected our families. It has kind of separated, um, you know, a little bit of, of, you know, the what is that we knew, the El Paso that we knew and, and what it is now. And yeah, and it's something that we are not really seeing changing, even uh, even post uh, 2016, 2020. I, I refer it, that to a period uh, historically, which I think uh, everyone needs to understand and appreciate rather than give credence to um, perpetrators of, of violence and hatred and bigotry and racism. Um, I don't think we need to go beyond that, right? Um, that period of time, um, set in motion some events. Um, obviously, uh, we were very uh, unfortunate to experience the events of uh, August 3rd, uh, 2019, with the racist attack of our people at uh, the local Walmart here. And um, that person, of course, is still incarcerated and still, um, you know, going through our legal system. Uh, but things like that, th this is what we deal with. And yes, there is violence here. And yes, there is hatred here. And yes, we do see that presence. Um, part of that border wall <laughs> was privately funded uh, by another group of outside racists uh, with the help of some local people as well, which is another tragedy that we have to experience here. But it, it's a it's a very complicated phenomenon, uh, which you also talk about this, this kind of I think there's a confusion when when we see our own people demonstrate uh, what, what I refer to as self-loathing, where we internalize the oppressor, the colonizers, the mentality in some sort of misguided attempt for financial and social ascension. And so we see that within ourselves, right? And we have to talk about that. And sometimes those are very difficult conversations because it's our own family and friends who may criticize the tone of their own skin, the pronunciation of their own name, which is something that uh, I know, you know, you have ideas about. I think definitely like that's, that's one of the things that, that I like to, um, I guess, auto uh, criticize because it, it is part of the community. It's part of, part of, you know, um, you know, what, what happens uh, at times it's easier to, 
to sort of go, it's easier to assimilate and, and go with that than to sort of fight against, uh, you know, uh, white supremacy or racism. And I believe that's one of the things that uh, sort of guides, um, you know, those type of uh, people towards conservatism or, or towards more, um, more to the right in a way. So, so definitely like there's criticism in, in, in the work, uh, you know, of that. And that's one of the things that I, I, I love about, one of the qualities I love about the work that you do is uh, your criticism of assimilation and the, the violence that is assimilation. Assimilation is violence, right? I think everybody can sit down and think about it and understand what it is that we mean. And the way you depict that in your work is also a very important part of, well, the reason it's so, it's so valuable to us and should be valuable to, you know, to, well, to everyone who's interested in what we're talking about, what they you know, will eventually be looking at. Um, so what you do, and again, uh, your humility again astounds me. We haven't really talked, um, I don't think enough about specific images. I do wanna, you know, draw the audience's attention to the the background. This is not a superimposed background. This is this is actually a real back, a real physical background. Uh, this is a four by eight painting by none other none other than Francisco Delgado. This is titled El Trono, translated as the throne, and we have the honor of living with this piece in our home. It's a, it's one of my favorite pieces. And one of the ones I, I saw again back in 1998 when I was a very, very poor graduate student. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to, to get this for my wife as a birthday gift. But can you tell us a little bit about this piece oh, and when, what people have been looking at in the background wondering, what is that behind him? In my early work, I, uh, again, I was trying to find my identity. Um, I think I, you know, I sort of lived with who I was, but, uh, you know, going through, um, I guess, through the education system and the university, and, you know, one of the purposes of, of going through that is to sort of question what you do, question who you are. Um, so in in the quest of, of finding myself, um, I, I always had this, uh, this conflict of, uh, of, like, who I was as a, you know, as a Mexicano, and then who I was as a person, a Mexicano living in the U.S. and and should I assimilate? Should I um, sort of fight against that? So it, it talks about that conflict. It talks about um, you know the the you know white mainstream you know culture and, and and the culture that I was actually part of. You know the working class. Um, you know in in those images I see you know my aunts. I see you know my you know my cousins. You know working in the uh, you know, uh, mowing the lawn and, and stuff like that, sort of, you know, the workforce. Um, so that, that it talks about that conflict, you know, the, the you know, the mainstream, uh, white mainstream, you know, culture sort of sitting back and, and watching us do all the work. Um, and, uh, you know, us sometimes not being, um, uh, I guess, uh, not being honored, not being you know awarded for you know for the work that we do uh, in in the U.S. Um, and that that's what you know what the, this painting basically talks about. And that's a that's a, another major theme. I, I don't want to call it a common thing, but it's a major thing that I I was also tr attracted to in your work is this honoring of this anonymous labor force and the masked figures that you presented in this series and. Um, the piece owned by well, Juan Sandoval, now at the Mexi Arte Museum in Austin, also has these masked figures. And that image is of a, of a little boche, right? A Volkswagen Beetle bug uh, sitting atop of one of our bridges here in El Paso, one of our international bridges. And it has an image of Abraham Lincoln um, going up to and approaching the occupants of this beetle, right? This bug, and you see the the vendors around the one the vehicle as well, and uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful piece as well. Uh, the, the last time I saw that piece in person was in 1998. I never did to, did it, did, uh, get to see it at Cinco Puntos Press, but that image appears in a lot of other articles that I've come across. And again, 
very very powerful imagery and of course you continue that here right yeah so so the so the the wrestling mask uh, it literally in well in spanish the luchador is wrestler really uh, translate to somebody that's you know that that struggles or, or somebody that is uh, that is in the fight so uh, I, again, seeing the you know the Mexicanos as as a worker and, and fighting to survive, fighting to to improve the life of their you know of their family, um, I sort of made like you know put on uh, like a you know a dark mask so that it would be void of any design, anything uh, that would sort of stand out and you know them seen as uh, as something like anonymous or something that is kind of part of the background. Um, so that is you know the the reason why we, you know, I put the, the wrestling mask and, and sort of like the same as that other uh, painting called twenty six dollars, is the, you know, the the vendors, you know, the people, uh, the windshield washers, sort of become like you know this kind of burden or, or burden or, or kind of part of the landscape that we really don't notice, we really don't uh, see uh, see them as as people at times. So. Um, so yeah, you know that's that's the reason why why you know the lucha is is present in the work and the mask. And for a lot of people in this country who've never crossed uh, an international bridge, either the northern border, I don't I don't know if they have actually bodies of water to cross, but and either do we here, right? Or the Rio Grande is now just a canal, a cemented in canal, uh, but fenced off multiple times. But um, the weights on the bridge can be hours long, and so there is like a culture there is a, a community that exists on the bridge is right here uh here on the border right where people sell, sell everything from chiclets these little gums all the way up to you know large size or life-size portraits of the virgen de guadalupe it's, you know you can buy just about anything during your wait times on the bridge right as you're waiting to get there were like casa de cambios like they would have money and you would change your your pesos for dollars you know people would have have that um, I don't know if it, it, it was a good idea because sometimes there's a lot of money <laughs> that they have. <laughs> um, they get a, away with it, but at some point it was even that. It was even a bank, you know, as they, while we wait, you know, to, to cross over the, to the U.S. Right. Well, while we wait to be granted access, uh, and that's another discussion altogether. Uh, I think that that's a piece waiting to be done uh, the little garritas, a little inspection booth uh, on the U.S. side, where we we meet the anonymous people in the blue uniforms that you know will interrogate us and determine our validity as people allowed to enter mm -hmm. uh, legally into this country with the right documentation. Right. Um, so you work a lot with these very very deep and very very nuanced and very beautiful political kind of. Uh, ideas and and again criticisms and, and contradictions and going back and forth to the identity and, and this work is obviously a result of you, your existence here in Juarez and in Paso growing up in Segundo Barrio. Uh, again for those of us who don't know what we're talking about, Segundo Barrio is essentially the the southernmost uh, neighborhood bordering what is downtown El Paso and then moving eastward or I don't know the exact distance. I hope it may be like, what is it, two, three miles to about uh, Jefferson Coliseum area? Uh, I, I think it's mostly like uh, Guillen, Paisano, uh, Guillen Middle School, like around that area, Paisano, and then close to what is bordering downtown. I guess mm -hmm. like Banton Street or El Paso Street. So that would be even like it, like even less, right? It's like half a mile. So it's it's a very very distinct neighborhood. So uh, officially, it's called the Second Ward, um, and it's uh, the current neighborhood that is in most danger of being gentrified um, because of well, a long list of reasons, which we won't get into. But it's a uh, it's a neighborhood that that you know intimately, that I know intimately. Um, my father grew up in and died in that neighborhood. Uh, I was always going back and forth between. My neighborhood in Socorro, uh, Texas, and Segundo, um, but it's it's an area that is vibrant. That is, um, I would say, ninety five percent just brown people. I, I don't know the exact statistic, but it was not more. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, David Romo, author David Romo, called it you know the Ellis Island of the Southwest. Um, this is where uh, you know people from all over uh, you know Latin America come. 
um, you know, kind of establish themselves and then spread out to or branch out to to other cities in the U.S. You know, L.A., Chicago, Denver, uh, Dallas. So it's like it's it's uh, truly uh, an important area in in uh, in the U.S. Yeah, an important area and yet one that needs to be uh, protected, needs to be preserved. Um, and there's just I don't know what else to say about that. It just it needs to happen. Of course, there are issues that that we know about, but you have also practiced throughout your academic career. And um, it, I think it's really cool that, we, uh, that that we get to talk to somebody who went to a local high school, who went to El Paso Community College, um, something you and I share in common as well. Uh, University of Texas El Paso, and then one of the things again that I later on discovered about you. So you went to Yale, and you don't talk a lot about that. And I'm still trying to, to get you to kind of to talk a little bit more about these things. But uh, when when I first went to to your studio and you invited me into your to your space to your home, and thank you again so much for that. It was it was just an awesome awesome experience. Um, you were telling me about what well some of the things that you went through uh, at Yale, and then you were showing me what you were working on while you were there, and I was just blown away. And I remember leaving your home and driving over the mountain with my wife and talking about it, and I, I really didn't know where to start the conversation, but um, there were two pieces in particular that I just was so in love with. Um, and my wife asked me, it's like, so which one did you like the most? And so I, I started talking about the, the image of your newborn daughter um, on the East Coast and uh, the, the way that was depicted. I said that that was just like, to me, it, it's one of the, the most uh, lasting images in my brain. I mean, it'll be there until I die. But, you know, I would say it's like, wow, that, you know, that needs to be in, you know, Bancho's personal collection, you know, forever. Um, and that was just monumental. But your education has taking you places and giving you you know an opportunity to you know to grow your own work and and reflect on what you know what this all means and i, I just want you to talk a little bit about how your your formal education you know uh, i guess we can incorporate some language like fine art versus everything contrary to that concept and how it either has helped you or hindered you well i mean uh Going through the to the uh, the Yale School of Art uh, art program um, or edu uh, system of education kind of taught me both world the you know the fine art and the kind of like what I was sort of uh, was used to, which is you know depicted as like or 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 seen as a low art, uh, which is you know muralism, which is you know, street art, um, you know urban urban images. Um, so, so I early <clears throat> that in the two years that I was there um, learned that that I was you know different than others because you know while you know some people wanted to you know to sort of go into galleries and museums and and wanted to talk to curators um, I I wanted to you know to paint murals I wanted to speak to the people I wanted to, you know for them to have their own um, you know. Uh, I guess urban museum, if you will, um, and that was one of the one of the things that that I kind of saw, you know, sort of conflict. I think you know people that go to the, they want to go to the Yale School of Art because they want to be, uh, you know, super art, art superstars. They want to be an art published in art in America, and you know, uh, you know, published in like the New York Times and all that. So, uh, so that's one of the things that I that I early learned. You know, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be. Um, so even while I was there, I was, you know, trying to depict these, you know, very large, uh, very large paintings, uh, which kind of emulated, you know, murals. Um, I was uh, able to paint one of the uh, one one of the walls there at the university with, uh, in collaboration with Marcel Montoya. Um, that it's, you know, that painting it's still there. That mural painting is still there. Um, which one is that? It's um. It's at La Casa Cultural Julia de Burgos, uh, which is in a building that kind of houses a lot of the Latino organizations at Yale. Um, and that's one of the places where I sort of went to uh, because I felt, uh, you know, kind of alienated from, you know, from my peers. 
Um, I felt, uh, uh, you know, that I needed sort of like a little bit of taste of, you know, from back home. Um, you know, that was the first time that I traveled so far that I lived outside of El Paso. Um, so, so I went to that, you know, to uh, La Casa Cultural and, you know, became very good friends with, uh, uh, with a lot of, you know, Latinos, a lot of Boricuas, uh, Dominicanos and stuff. And, and we shared a lot of things that were in common. So while I was there, um, Maceo, Maceo Montoya was, was, you know, studying, um, I believe history or English. Um, and we kind of connected, you know, we had in common that, you know, we both were artists, we, you know, um, we sort of believed in the same things and, and we, uh, we collaborated, collaborated in a mural. Um, I'll send you the image, uh, you know, I wish I had it <laughs> right off hand, but, but it's, you know, it sits there and it's the, you know, the, the only Chicano, you know, mural in, in, uh, at Yale University. So, um, so even that was, was kind of a, a conflict um, within uh, within the university because they uh, they uh, the Latino community wanted for us to paint that mural, yet the the main university was uh, was kind of against it. They would always um, uh, find a reason why we shouldn't paint it, whether it was you know um, you know money, the funding was you know was a problem at first. And then uh, you know we found the found the funding, and then you know the liability they wanted for us to sign like you know legal documents and and all that stuff, so that we wow. you know we wouldn't so the university wouldn't be liable if if an ex accident happened, um, which at that time it didn't make sense, but now you know in retrospect it it did because it we were actually working on three tiers of scaffolding, um, but we you know we were young, you know we were. Marcel must have been like, you know, maybe 19 years old. You know, I was like 21 or 20, you know, 23 or whatever. But um, uh, we decided that one day, you know, since they gave us a lot of, you know, they, they put a lot of obstacles that one day during spring break, we just were gonna paint the mural. The design was already set and everything. We had approval from, you know, the community. So, you know, on a Saturday when everybody left uh, the university, we put up scaffolding we whitewashed the wall while well, we cleaned it whitewashed the wall and then we started drawing a uh, couple of days people in a couple of days you know we had it, everything was all set and um, you know ready to paint and then we got a note from uh, from the dean that said you know what um, you did not get permission from us um, you you need to see us immediately um, so we uh, we had to stop you know in a way we, I was scared you know I I didn't want to lose, you know, my education. Maceo was was a little bit more brave than than I was, um, but uh, but yeah. So we met with the dean, and and ultimately, you know, we went back and forth. We met a couple of times, and and we said, you know what, the wall's already whitewashed. You can either sandblast it, or you can let us paint what the community wants. And uh, we were about to get kicked out, and and you know the dean finally decided that you know what that's we can't do anything about it so just might as well you know paint it um so they allowed us you know after that struggle yeah you know, um you know to to sort of put our our art uh, or the the voice of the community out there and what does uh can, can you describe the image because i'm really curious nothing nothing controversial it's it's about um sort of a pyramid of a mass of people uh, you know, one tier holding like a plank or like a like a platform so that others could climb up. Uh, so there were three tiers and at the end of like the very top, you know, it was basically community like workers and and attorneys and people that have, you know, gone through the struggle sort of going up the ladder and, and, and becoming successful. Um, and that is basically, you know, what it what it was. Um, so so there was again, there was nothing, uh, nothing I guess too political. I think your microphone is off. Yeah, yeah and 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 I think um, if you're still recording, uh. I think that that what that was one of the one of the successes of of you can't hear me. I'm going 
to chat. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I think, yeah, I think my, my thingies died on me, so let me just throw these away. Uh, <laughs> I just I use them because of the background noise and all of our dogs, but you can hear me now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I guess I'll go back in editing and see, make sure that that you didn't get cut off. But for, for the last sec, for the last thirty seconds, can you repeat that just in case it did so, get cut off? So at the end, I can hear it here. So at the end, we um we ended up painting the mural that became, you know, sort of like a you know, a symbol of, of, you know, the struggle, even within like the, the, you know, within that struggle, it was like, you know, hard to, to sort of get our, our vision, our images, our voice out there. Um, so, uh, so the Latino community there, you know, we celebrated, we, you know, up to, up to now, you still see it, you know, uh, published in, in, uh, in, uh, in websites and, and people talk about it. There's been articles uh, written about it. But yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the you know sort of like it it uh, it mirrors our struggle in 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 this country, uh, you know the struggle to put our voices out there to put you know who we are. Again, when you say it's it's appeared in some articles, that should be very loosely interpreted because you're so <laughs> humble. Again, it's probably in some of the the nation's most important publications, but uh, I'll let the audience do the work themselves. Uh, so you, you've mentioned some really important people, and it's been years since I, I've spoken to Marcel, but he comes from a family of, of artists. It's just, it's like the super family, right? Um, who have been your major influences? You know, can you talk a little bit about the connection between your aesthetic and your influences aesthetics? Well, I think, you know, for sure influences, you know, we, we can go back to, to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, Mesoamerican art, uh, there's a little bit of like, you know, Mayan kind of aesthetic to, you know, to the work, especially the early work, you know, the, 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 sort of the painting that you have behind you, uh, you know, the sort of the, you know, the stylization of like the faces, um, depicting of those, those faces, it, it's part of it. Um, but um, after that, you know, we, I have the, the, the Tres Grandes, you know, the uh, Muralistas, Siqueiros, Orozco, and Rivera, um, have been a you know great influence in the work. Um, other you know Chicano artists, Malakias has, has been also very influential. And I and I I go to other you know to other areas where you know Max Beckman has has been um, one of the, the the persons that I that I really look up to or looked up to you know when I was uh, sort of uh, in my formal education. Uh, you know the way he would. Um, the pick spaces, uh, composition was really important. Um, um, other others have uh, that have influenced would be uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña, uh, Coco Fusco. Like those uh, those artists have been, you know, their their art performances are, are very direct. And when I saw that for the first time, I was like, wow! Like they're not afraid. They're not, you know, they're not afraid to really. Uh, speak their mind they're not you know they're not afraid to to act who they you know who they are not they're not afraid to have an accent um and still be uh, be important still be like uh you know powerful so those were were my influences others you know luis jimenez uh, you know local or, or national artist um you know I, I sort of uh just studied his his uh, style of drawing you know when i was at, at utep I mean, there's there's been many. Uh, you know, my mother was also another um, another big influence. Uh, you know, single single parent. Este, you know, just going through the struggle. I think she was one of the the biggest influences as well. Yeah, going back to that that labor motif uh, that you capture in so much of your work, and again, this is all connected to your identity and how that's depicted. Uh, one of the questions uses the term which um, I, we're not going to define here on this video because, again, I want the audience members to also do their own work, but um, I, I identify as a Chicano and with the question that I presented to you is asking you whether or not you'll you know, identify as Chicano 
Uh, if you yes, if you explain a little bit about that identity, how that factors into your art, does it affect your art in very specific ways? Um, and again, the, the politics that are contained in your work. And I guess this is me projecting my, you know, my views of the world onto who, you know, what you're doing. But to me, it just, it, it's, it's everything that I have used to formulate my understanding and to hopefully use to explain to others what my identity means. Uh, so. Well, so going through the journey of, of, uh, of finding an identity, I, uh, at the beginning, I, I, you know, coming from Juarez and, and, and everything that I kind of, like, you know, sort of identified myself as, you know, Mexicano. I was like a Mexicano from Terizo. And the, whenever I heard the term Chicano, I always associated it with something that was negative, um, you know, like a pocho or something. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be that. And I think as, as, as I read more, as I sort of became more aware of my surroundings, um, I, I sort of started understanding, you know, what the term meant um, at graduate school. Uh, you know, Maceo and Malakias Montoya were very influential in, in teaching me about Chicanismo and, and what it is. And once I started actually internalizing everything that was said, my experience, I was like, you know what, I, I am a Chicano. Even though I, you know, I wasn't born in this country, I, I am all those things, I'm part of that struggle. I, I benefit from that struggle. Um, and even like reading uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña that he's, you know, he's from Mexico City, but he says that he's always in the process of, of uh, what do you call it? He calls it, uh, I guess, becoming a Chicano. He's, it's always part of the process. So I am, you know, I am everything that, that, uh, that everything that, that I experience, I am a fronterizo, I'm a Mexicano, I am a Chicano. Uh, and ultimately, you know, I call myself a Bordeño. Uh, you know, a person from, you know, from the border that has everything, everything that, that it, uh, encompasses, you know, those, those political terms. Um, that's, you know, that's basically who I am. So I embrace that, that term, um, you know, dearly, I, I, because I've, uh, I feel like I am, again, like part of that struggle. Struggle, yeah, and that's, I think it's, that's a key term that I, most people who identify with some form of Chicanismo. Um, now, you know, my, my program, uh, Chicanic Studies, now is talking about the complications of gender fluidity, gender identification, and gender expectations and roles and whatnot. Uh, but what you're talking about, that struggle, I think is something that is, that is tantamount to that examination of that not just a, it's not a duality anymore. We understand that yeah, it's not just black and white. It's it's so complicated, especially again, one of the more beautiful things that we uh, encompass as a community is the ability to flow between both sides, between both languages, between both ideologies, and then find little niches right within all of those and develop a unique sensibility, which is what you present as well. Uh, there is no getting around this. So your work is political. Uh, the identity formation that you depict is highly politicized. Um, and then again, we could also, you know, break it down and say, well, you know, everything was, um, Antonio Gramsci said, you know, to live is to, is to choose sides. So everything is about politics. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But your work, and there's one piece that I'm thinking about, which um, it caught my wife's eye and then I started looking at it and realizing what it was was the the black widow spider on the web and the spider depicting uh ice uh immigration customs informant which is I guess the larger umbrella of Department of Homeland Security if I'm not uh, mistaken I've lost track there's so many agencies now um but that that black widow again it's it, it's it's clearly you know dangerous. It's clearly everything that you expect. But can you talk a little bit about that that particular print? Well, for that that print, and it's also part of a mural that uh, that we painted here in, in Central El Paso, um, collaboration with uh, Juan Ortiz. Um, that that idea or or sort of the the concept of it 
came from uh, Tigres del Norte uh, song, uh, the Paisano Paisano, where the Tigres are talking about the, the patron, um, that, you know, the patron is weaving like this, uh, this uh, spider web so that the worker gets trapped. You know, they, they, uh, they get trapped within, you know, within the system, they, they can't uh, advance. So I saw kind of like similarities in, in, in ice or in, um, in these, uh, I guess what, you know, what they call the, the law enforcement, border law enforcement agencies that sort of throw a web so that they can trap families, so that they can separate uh, families. And, and that's where the image is coming from. Um, you know, the, the, the little ice helmet sort of just to, for people to know who, who that, that spider web is or, or what it is. So that particular piece, and I can't remember the date uh, that we acquired it, but this was, I'm gonna guess it was, it was, it was pre-2016. Um, but I, mean, I, I can't, I'm not too sure how we can talk about this without even going into those specific details because I don't really don't want to invoke certain names uh, simply out of just, well, you know, you know <laughs> a desire to not, you know, give credence to the to those those four years, right? But your work again, it's there. It's obvious. One of the reasons that we love it so much and that we choose to live with it as well. Uh, can, have you done, have you worked on, and can you speak about any very recent pieces that are a reflection of our very recent political experience? Again, the year is now 2021, and we just survived, you know, four years of, of well, domestic war. Yeah, I mean, I think I, during those four years, I, I can't say that I, that I really, you know, that that I really didn't do work that spoke of, of the situation of what we lived uh, through. Um, but I think like now, now that it's, it's sort of over and we're, we have sort of like a new, like a positive vision or, or kind of a, uh, of hopes that, that, you know, the nation will go in the right direction. I think the work is sort of, you know, becoming a little bit more positive. It's, uh, um, it's, not, as, it's not as dark as before. And I think, you know, with, you know, going through the pandemic and, and all this, I, I feel like, you know, what's going to happen, you know, within, let's say, you know, starting, you know, this summer and the fall, I think there's going to be a lot of really powerful art that's going to be created um, because of what we have gone through. And, uh, you know, the trauma that, that we've experienced as, you know, as, as people of the world, I think that uh, definitely like uh, the artwork has become a little bit more optimistic um, and uh, and positive, and again, you know, trying to reach the community and telling them, you know, what it's going to be okay, and uh, we're going to, you know, we're headed in the right direction if everybody works together. And yeah, that is the hope. Um, and again, uh, for those of, of us who will be viewing this video in the future, yes, we have the pandemic as well, so we're fighting a virus on top of another virus that we had, uh, but. Uh, Yes, we're, we're, we're going to make it out, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the term, and going back to identity um, of, you know, uh, Chicanismo, uh, Fronterizo, uh, and I love the term that you use, Bordeño, um, getting people to understand it and what it means, uh, getting people to, you know, understand what it means within, you know, the larger world of art, uh, especially graphic art. I mean, because there are obviously so many different levels and genres of it. Uh, I often take it very personally when people want to start talking about, you know, well, what is, you know, a Chicano writer? Because that's my background. Uh, and then I, I have to also consider, well, people don't necessarily like the idea of being pigeonholed or being boxed into a space. Uh, because of a lot of very valid reasons, but I mean, these issues are there and they're, they're ever present. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what is, you know, Chicano art within the larger world of art and how does it matter? And should it be distinguished, you know, as something within a larger thing itself? Yeah, well, Chicano art is, is uh, I guess, in 
uh, subcategory of art. It's not really like the mainstream. It's it's something that you do uh, locally or it's something that you do with your community. Um, and it's not necessarily something that is commercial, something that is um, for everybody. You know, it's it's possibly not not for you know the you know the the MoMA or or big galleries um, to you know to sort of uh, you know show the work. So I think as a Chicano artist, there there has to be um, there has to be an awareness of what the community is going through. Uh, there has to be a political awareness more than anything, um, and uh, and that's basically what you know what what the Chicano or, or a Chicano painter would would sort of uh, have concepts or, or themes. Um, um, so so yeah, so definitely, like I I believe that you know that that you have some sort of paint for the community. Um, otherwise, you're you know a Mexican American painter or you're you know something else that 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 uh, that sort of assimilates to mainstream. Um, commercial success is not necessarily important um, for a lot of Chicano artists, or for most, I would say, for ninety five percent of you know, Chicano artists. But um, definitely, like the community takes care of you. Uh, you know, I, I've been very fortunate to be in in great collections, such as you know your collection, um, your art collection, and, and that gives us, you know, um, the, the kind of the ammunition to keep on producing, to, to sort of keep on going with, you know, with what we do, uh, because we're not going to be, again, like in, uh, shown in, 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 these, uh, in these galleries and, and probably like in, uh, in Chelsea or, you know, New York and, and stuff. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's the way it, kind of I see, you know, myself and I see the, sort of the trend of Chicano art. And, and, that's, and that's something that I, I'm still trying to figure out. And, and I, I love, uh, I've been able to develop relationships with you and, and other artists that we love and, and support. And we wish we could support even more. <laughs> uh, but it, it's one of those things that we understand that requires a delicacy. Your work is labor. Your work is an understanding. It is the product of your knowledge, of your experience, but ultimately it is work and it, it needs to be honored. And when, and when we say honored, and you, of course, and you and I have talked about this before, it, it doesn't just need to be displayed and viewed and discussed, it needs to be compensated. And how do we do that? And, you know, and, and how do we respond to, 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 to comments that are flippant or dismissive of certain works? You know, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, brown artists, Chicano artists, not displayed at, you know, the MoMA in New York uh, or in Chelsea or um, in other areas where people go to see, quote unquote, fine art. And I, I cringe when I hear that phrase, fine art, because of its, its Eurocentric implications, right? It's, well, it's not even implications, they're very direct. We're, we're talking about, you know, the idea of importance, right? Who is important? Who's going to be displayed? Who's going to be you know, in demand, you know, how many millions of dollars will it capture? And of course, we see this in popularized media. We see them in, in short little titles, you know, in short little blurbs about a piece selling for a you know ridiculous amount of money. And things are constantly changing. And there's that commercial aspect and there's that world that that deals like literally we're talking about trading that deals in art that really takes away from well its purpose and it's one of the things that i struggle with and i know i know you have ideas about this but it's one of the things that i think a lot of people are interested in is like how much you know should art cost and it's one of these things that i don't know how to answer i just know that um it, it's it's beautiful and it deserves whatever the person who created it is telling you and that's pretty much the end of the discussion at that point um, but the general public has a different understanding. I'm thinking like, like massive art auctions, Sotheby's, right? Whatever. Uh, now there's a, a digital part of the world that is complicating the concept of art. And I didn't want to get into this idea that I am still trying to understand of what, the, what they're calling NFT, a non-fungible token. 
which is my understanding is a URL address to some data on the internet that people can buy for ridiculous amounts of money about art, a graphic depiction. That doesn't make sense to me because, well, I can't live with that and it's not the same thing. Uh, and this kind of goes back to the, our opening question. It's like, well, a print, you know, how do you value a print? You know that there's a huge difference between, um, well, maybe a uh, linoleum cut print versus uh, a stone print, which, you know, you didn't talk about. And that's one uh, that that graffiti number two, American graffiti number two was done on a massive stone. And I always remind myself when I look at that, that was carved into stone. This was your hand on a piece of stone. And then you put that through your printing process. And that, again, the labor, how, how do you quantify that? Um, people have, I guess, uh, dealers, galleries have an understanding of how they can market pieces, how they can negotiate those prices. And I, I'm always very tenuous about talking about those things, but it comes back to the value that we place on art in general, but then specifically this category of art and I do admit that it is a category because um, when we started, you know, being lucky enough to, you know, to get some art, we decided we only want art that we understand, that we appreciate, that we identify with, and that's all brown artists. And that's something that, that we're very, very passionate about and adamant about. Um, it, it's, it's important to us to support, to do what we can to honor and then to pass that knowledge and that understanding of appreciation on to others because as people look at what we love and they ask questions you've heard this it's like so here it comes it's a really uncomfortable question right how much okay well they're they're curious right but we also understand that they're trying to assign importance with a monetary value which Again, I mean, we're talking commercialism, right? And I, I think you, you know, talking about value, how much something is worth um, could be from, you know, for example, a lot of, I would say uh, most of the murals that I've painted have, er everything has been voluntary work. Um, so that's one of the things that if, even if I spend, you know, a couple of months working on a project and I'm basically not getting paid for anything, um, I value, because I value it so much because people are going to get to see it and and the person that might not have uh, you know or want the want the need or, or or want to go into into a museum is going to be able to appreciate it and it's going to speak to them and, and it possibly it's going to make them you know a better person um, so 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 that to me is like to me is the real value I think um, I'm, I'm also, I'm not one that says, you know what, I've spent 90 hours on a piece, you know, times, you know, how much should I pay myself, you know, $15 an hour, $10 an hour minimum, you know, how much I multiply it times that. And, and, and I, and I, I'm not one that sort of has to do that uh, or that wants to do that because then uh, I'm probably going to, you know, you know, <laughs> end up just volunteering my time again. So, so one of the reasons why, why I, I, you know, why I teach is also to help myself produce something that is not dictated by a gallery. It's not dictated by somebody else's vision. You know, it's my vision because I have, I'm able to, you know, to support my family. I'm able to, to sort of um, be comfortable enough where I can keep producing something that is going to speak to, you know, to, to the community. Um, so, so as far as, you know, value in, within the commercial, uh, I guess realm would be that, you know, um, I like prints because again, they're accessible. Like if I have a painting that I spent, you know, X amount of hours could be worth, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, right. Versus a print where I spent, you know, possibly a week, I can, you know, sell it at a reasonable price. And still get a little bit of you know of profit so that I can keep on buying more materials and keep producing and keep on going you know traveling to Oaxaca to make prints or Veracruz or Austin. Um, that's that's basically what you know 
the value that I find within my work. Yes, I'm I'm part of also you know other um, other other I guess commercial things with you know illustrating children's books, um, which also brings probably the you know more money than <laughs> what I've made in 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 you know in, in the in my paintings or in my drawings, um, which is another aspect that kind of helps me you know helps me produce more work that that can be very direct can be very political or social. Um, so, so I think as far as value, it's like, I, I really, you know, after so many years, I don't have a grasp on, on what the value of things or the value of things that I make. But I think, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to, that most of my work has gone into collections that are appreciate, you know, that appreciate what I do and that are willing to share the work they're not storing it they're showing it they're you know uh, publishing it and, and that's to me that's uh, uh, you know that's that's valuable enough um and, and again what, what i started saying at the beginning is still true you're, you're just really really humble <laughs> in terms of yeah promoting what you do and talking about the value um i'm always curious about how the public you know consumes and it's, it's usually the subject matter that gets discussed right and then name association and exclusivity and uh, another thing that we've been learning about uh, which we are <laughs> running away from is the idea of representation for uh, certain artists and, and and certain artists you know do have representation agents right like you know certain writers have agents as well and uh, those always send off, you know, kind of like these signals. Um, and the artists, of course, deserve that that kind of support and that kind of promotion. Uh, but again, looking at how art is consumed in this country um, and based on the subject matter and the importance of what you produce, um, it's, it's, it's not really, you know, being supported the way it needs to be, right? Uh, I can think of just one major brown, uh, I'm sorry, brown major brown painter uh, working in New York whose work is now represented and who commands it's just you know an astronomical amount of money for his work and you know it, and it should be that way, absolutely should be that way. But does that necessarily dictate importance? Well, I, you know I, I think the answer is I think nebulous, but I think it's clear. Uh, I mean. And maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot because <laughs> we, I still I still need more of your stuff, Pancho. So <laughs> ignore everything I've just said. <laughs> it's been recorded, so <laughs> you're recording it. <laughs> yes, to all right. Okay, I know. Well, I just I want to thank you so much for for giving of yourself, your time, and and uh, participating in this interview and this project is so important and. Um, Hopefully this will be shared far and wide and more and more people will learn about what it is that, you know, that you do and who you are and maybe through some fancy post-production editing, we're going to be like showing, showing some images as we speak here. I'm not the person. Yeah, for the background and your prints and, and uh, we're fortunate enough to have run out of wall space. So we have a lot of stuff that's not even mounted. Um, uh, when, I, when I was talking to Marco Sanchez, uh, I was kind of embarrassed because I have not gotten around to mounting any of his work. And yeah, you know, we have you in, in a lot of our spaces. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think he was a little bit, you know, concerned about that, but I assured him I'm going to get to work on it, man. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about the work. We're, we're, we're heading in that direction. But uh, this is to say that you all matter so much to us. And um, we're very, very lucky. We're very fortunate to to be allowed to, you know, to to share our world with you. And I just want to thank you for everything that it is that you work on and to pr to promote um, a sensibility, an aesthetic, an idea, an importance, uh, the values, uh, the identity, um, your work as as a leader, as a you know a teacher, a professor, uh, your work, which is very very understated in terms of promotion um the fact that you know it just astounds me people are going to be looking you up and saying oh my gosh this is him wow it's crazy it is it absolutely is so francisco delgado um pay attention uh and if you if you have the opportunity to meet him 
in the future once we come out of this this crisis and absolutely jump on that you're, you're you're a blessing to all of us and again th thank you i want to i want to thank you as well for you know giving me this you know this opportunity to you know to talk you you know to to you talk to your audience and and hopefully um you know people will will learn something from my experience and and uh and ultimately become better you know better people from it. Absolutely. Well, again, uh, this has been Francisco Delgado and Mauricio Rodriguez, and this is part of my project for the Humanities Collaboration at El Paso Community College and University of Texas at El Paso. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Mauricio.